Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Rahul Prakash of In-House Community, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to today's webinar, which is the Dispute Resolution Symposium. Uh, today, we will focus on arbitration in Hong Kong and China. Uh, I would like to thank uh, our co-hosts for today, Lynx Law Firm and Hill Dickinson. Uh, thank you very much. Now we start the webinar with a presentation by Patrick Zeng and Charles Chin of Lynx Law Firm. Then we move on to uh, the presentation by Yvette Yu and Nicole Wong of Hill Dickinson. But first, some housekeeping rules. Uh, there will naturally be an opportunity to ask questions during the presentation. So please type your questions in the Q&A button. Uh, which will be on your Zoom webinar interface, probably to the right of your screen or at the bottom of your screen. And we'll, I'll personally make sure that uh, the, uh, the presentation, uh, presenters see these questions and answer them if there is time. And this would be done uh, most likely at the end of each presentation. There'll also be a very short survey at the end of the webinar, uh, which I would ask everyone to wait and uh, fill this particular form because it's quite helpful for us to keep presenting or keep coming up with new webinars and new topics. A very quick word about the in-house community. Uh, our mission is to empower and educate in-house counsel for the benefit of all. Uh, we have over 17,000 members altogether along the new Silk Road. Uh, we also publish uh, the IHC magazine or the in-house community magazine, uh, which replaced Asian MENA Council magazine. In fact, we'll be publishing our dispute resolution special report in the coming few weeks with uh, articles from Link's law firm, Hill Dickinson, and a few others. So please, you if you've already signed up for this webinar, you'll receive the magazine in your email. It's an e-magazine. Now, it's my great pleasure to invite Patrick Zeng and Charles Chin of Lynx Law Firm to lead us through their presentation on China arbitration law, proposed amendments, and the impact. So quick introduction, Patrick, Patrick Zeng obtained his LLB degree at the Fudan University and LLM degrees at the University of International Business and Economics, UC Berkeley Law School. He's qualified to practice law in China and New York. He's also a panel arbitrator in various arbitration institutions such as CTAC, CAC, HKIAC, KCAB, KLRCA, and more. And then we also have Charles Chin with us. Charles earned his LLB from Fudan University and his MS in International Finance from East China Normal University. He studied EMBA at Tsinghua University and has been practicing PRC law since 1990. His practice areas include dispute resolution, banking and financial services, corporate M&A, private equity, venture capital, trust and insurance. Uh, very interestingly, on a practical training scheme for Chinese lawyers sponsored by British government, he studied law at SOAS, SOAS, and received training at Linklates and Breakboard Chambers, and he co-founded Lynx Law in 1998. So, Patrick and Charles, over to you. It's, it's your screen. Thank you. Yeah, it's my great pleasure to share with you about the recent developments of Chinese arbitration law. And uh, I want to thank you know, our council community for inviting our firm to make this presentation. So in the next 25 or 30 minutes, I will share with you some uh, key characteristics of Chinese arbitration and the proposed amendments recently circulated by the Ministry, Ministry of Justice. And that should be most the fundamental change of Chinese arbitration regime and might be interesting to all of you and also pra uh, arbitration practitioners. So I will briefly touch upon all those issues and those issues are listed in accordance with the order of the uh, Chinese Arbitration Act or the PRC Arbitration Law. And all these issues will, will be 
the most important issues in Chinese arbitration. And uh, we'll also touch upon what amendments will be made in all those issues. And before I uh, move on to the amendments, I will first briefly touch upon the general overview of the Chinese, the current Chinese arbitration regime. And the first is that, as you probably know, that the entire Chinese arbitration regime is designed for institutional arbitration. And uh, ad hoc arbitration is not enforceable if you choose China as the seat of arbitration. And the second issue is that the purely domestic disputes are not allowed to be arbitrated outside the mainland of China. And the third one is the due treatment to domestic arbitration and international or foreign related arbitration. And also Chinese arbitration law requires strict, a, that there will be strict requirements for valid arbitration agreements, in particular designation of an arbitral commission. And also the writing requirement is strict and the arbitration agreement must be signed by the parties, of course, with some exceptions. And, and also Chinese law has a very unique system of competence, competence, and the judicial review of the jurisdictional challenge. And uh, more importantly, the arbitral tribunal has no power to issue interim measures or parameteric orders. And uh, the third party's arbitration is, uh, is also limited to agency and assignment and a lot of grounds in, uh, in, in England or the United States are not available in China, in China. And also Chinese arbitration is well known for its extremely streamlined process. So for example, after the constitution, uh, constitu uh, constitution of the tribunal, the secretaries of the arbitral institutions will almost immediately arrange, arrange an oral hearing. And the notice period is as short as like a 20 or one month. So you uh, parties can expect that an oral hearing will be held after the constitution of the tribunal in the next one or two months. And that is fundamentally or strikingly different from the practice in Hong Kong or in other jurisdictions. And the risk judicata and the finality of arbitration is also a great concern, a great issue in China. And a lot of disputes are re-arbitrated from, from the perspective of Western practitioners. And also uh, the, uh, the status of foreign arbitration institution in China will also be addressed in this amendment. Move on. And the first issue is arbitrability. Under Chinese law, contractual and other proprietary disputes can be arbitrated. But family law and the status of persons like marital adoption, guardianship, support, or succession cannot be arbitrated. And this is not, uh, not different from other jurisdictions. And also, Disputes between administrative agencies and the citizens and companies or legal entities will not be, cannot be arbitrated. And in this amendment, the eco subject, which was originally uh, a requirement of, for application of the arbitration law, was to be deleted, is to be deleted. It's probably opening the way to investment arbitration between foreign arbitrary, foreign investor and the host state. But the issue is there are a number of unresolved issues that with the tortious disputes arising out of the contract can be arbitrated. And the, the, the judicial decision is split in this point. And unfortunately, the new arbitration law 
seems I, I not to address this issue at the moment. And whether intellectual property rights, bankruptcy disputes, or antitrust disputes, or the competition disputes are arbitrable. All these issues uh, will not be addressed, uh, at least from uh, the draft amendment, the proposed amendment. So no uh, amendment has been made. The answer model law, and the answer model law, the commercial disputes covers the all relationship of a commercial nature, whether contractual or not. And the non-arbitrability is due to its very nature, must be determined by the state courts or by private tribunals. And the general trend, the modern trend, is to find virtually all manner of disputes arising from international commercial disputes are arbitral. At least the award is binding into party. But uh, the proposed amendment has not addressed this issue and has not allowed arbitrating such disputes, at least inter party. So this is a, a, a judicial case law. You can see that the Supreme People's Court held that antitrust law is obviously public law in nature and cannot be arbitrated. So this is the current position of Chinese law. And uh, the, the proposed amendment has not uh, tried to change uh, the current situation. The second issue is the compelling of arbitration. That under Chinese arbitration law, that the court shall decline jurisdiction in Chinese terms, the court shall not accept the case unless the arbitration agreement is now and void. Article 8 of the Ancestral Moral Law that the, the court should, the court seat of dispute should enforce, enforce the arbitration agreement and decline jurisdiction unless it finds that the arbitration agreement is now in void, inoperative, or incapable of being performed. And there are quite large uh, jurisprudence and case law. What is now in void? What is inoperative? And what is incapable of being performed? Uh, this um, proposed amendment uh, seems not try to uh, adopt the answer model law, at least those terms and usages, inoperative or incapable of being performed. So again, uh, the, uh, the arbitration agreement cannot be enforced in China if it is held that now and void. And what is the nullity of arbitration agreement? In Article 22 says that the subject matter of arbitration is beyond the scope of statutory provisions. But actually, the true meaning of this provision should be the subject matter of arbitration is non-arbitrable under Chinese law. <clears throat> so this is a uh, basically a arbitrability issue. So in other words, on Article 22, an arbitration agreement will be now and void if it tries to arbitrate a non-arbitrable subject matter. And I, I think this is a quite, quite interesting point that whether it can cause the arbitration agreement void, now and void. And the second reason is party incapacity. And the third issue, and or the last, last reason is, last ground is duress. So the interesting point, how about fraud, mistake, unconscionability, misrepresentation, or illegality will lead arbitration agreement now and void? Because under Chinese arbitration law, only three grounds are given that non arbitrability party incapacity, and duress. And 
this proposed amendment has not made more in-depth discussion or provision on the nature of arbitration agreements. There should be a unique type of contract. And there are a lot of discussions uh, in academic discussions. And we, uh, it seems that the current situation in China is that the, the nature of arbitration agreements is, is not an issue. And also the applicability of amiable compositor and ex actual bond. This is a very unique, unique uh, system in China because in applying law, uh, arbitrators, they very frequently, they apply an equity and the fairness. On the basis of equity and the fairness, as, and uh, they uh, apply ex equil bono and acting as amiable compositor. But under under ancestral model law, that ex ex equil bono and amiable compositor can only be applied if the parties agree. So this is a very uh, unique situation in Chinese arbitration law practice because. Sometimes the parties uh, will find that the arbitrators applied fairness and equity to adjudicate their case. And this will uh, concern the Euro Novit Curia issue. And I think uh, it is beyond the scope of today's discussion. So even uh, there might be some difference in Euro Novit Curia, which means that the judges know, know the law. But you are not the arbiter, the arbitrator is not law. And maybe we can discuss further in the future. And the extent of court intervention. So Article 8 says the arbitration should be independent and free from any interference from administrative organs, social, social organizations, and individuals. And interestingly enough, that they Article 8 omits that it should be free from the court's intervention unless, unless the law provides. And that is a, a, provided by Anselmodal law that in matters governed by, uh, governed by this law, no court shall intervene except where so provided by in this law. And the English Arbitration Act 1996 also have similar provision. And the extent of court intervention uh, in Chinese arbitration law, there are five aspects of intervention. The first is interim relief. And the second is judicial review, I'm sorry, judicial review uh, on the arbitral tribunal's decision on the jurisdictional challenge. And the third is annulment of arbitral award. And the fourth is enforcement of arbitral award. And this time, I will propose the amendment made some changes, and we will discuss later. And uh, Chinese course intervention is only limited to those aspects. So even without such provision that the court, uh, the arbitration is free from interference from courts, the Chinese courts are very strict because they have no cause of action to accept those cases other than or arising from those grounds we have in this slide. So the Chinese court, they cannot appoint arbitrator on the current arbitration regime. And the Chinese court, the Chinese courts cannot determine the challenge of arbitrator. And also the Chinese court, there is a, a no, they cannot determine to terminate an arbitrator's mandate when the arbitrator is unable to perform his obligations. And the Chinese court also can, uh, cannot, sorry, I have some problem with my slide. But in Chinese arbitration practice, in some very extreme cases, that there is long delay of, an, of the rendition of an arbitral war. This is a very uh, extremely exceptional case that, for example, like uh, uh, spend five or five or six years 
but the amateur award has not been rendered. And uh, uh, in this situation, because the Chinese court intervention, as I mentioned before, that is extremely limited and is strictly limited to the to the five grounds, five uh, five issues. There are so the, the the parties have no way to go to the court to force the, the arbitral tribunal to render an award expeditiously. And in this proposed amendment, uh, no such uh, amendment has been made. And the probably I, we may suggest uh, the Minister of Justice at this point. And the risk to Dakota is also a big issue because we have no actually uh, issue stockhold, or at least we can say that issue stockhold is not very clear. And the uh, cause of action stockhold is also not established. And uh, uh, more importantly, the abuse of process uh, should be established uh, because parties, uh, for example, they have separate claims and they can arbitrate some claims in this arbitration, leaving others in the next arbitration because no abuse of pro process system. So uh, there, are, there are quite a large number of arbitrations uh, that re-arbitrated after the formal arbitral award has been made. And because issue stop is not very clear. So sometimes the later arbitral tribunal modifies, modifies um, the, the, the ascertainment of facts and the application of law. And that is a big, uh, big issue. And unfortunately, the proposed amendment has not addressed this, this issue. And uh, the risk judicata under Chinese law, we uh, adopted a Swiss or French model that is the same, the triple identity test, the same parties, same cause of action, and the same plan. Uh, so if there are a triple uh, identity in place, then uh, it cannot be re-arbitrated. And what is the same cause of action? And formerly, the Chinese courts believe cause of action is something of a legal relationship. But now the Supreme People's Court is more and more uh, uh, believing that cause of action means that the whole set of facts giving rise to case. And this is you know, inconsistent with uh, the current trend, trend internationally. Uh, so uh, in terms of uh, Richard Carter, so uh, because the arbitral, arbitration law is silent on this point, so the court said that Richard Carter in civil procedure in China applies to arbitration. Uh, and the next issue is arbitration commission. Uh, arbitration commissions in China, or we, sh we should say that as a national and regional monopoly. You cannot set up arbitra arbitration commissions by yourselves. Uh, arbitration commission is different from setting up a company uh, or set setting up a law firm. It is monopolized by, by, by regions and uh, by the government. But, but this proposed amendment expanded the, the, uh, the scope of the arbitration commissions that cities uh, that are not big enough uh, to be divided into district, districts can establish arbitration commissions. So in the near future, I guess uh, more arbitration commissions will be established. And even they are uh, a creation of a national and a regional monopoly, but dynamic free market composition among arbitration commissions uh, 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 actually, the, uh, those uh, competitions between arbitration commissions actually uh, greatly enhances the efficiency and the credibility of arbitration in, in China. So we should say that although they are uh, created by a national monopoly, but, but they are competing uh, like uh, in a free, free market. 
and the qualification of adversary. So you can see that there are a quite strict qualification requirements. That is, uh, we should say that the proposed amendment are uh, stricter than the previous one. That you should be, you should have eight years of experience and you should pass the national bar examinations and you should be a lawyer as, uh, as a lawyer for at least eight years and a judges for eight years. And also you should have a senior uh, as a legal scholar and you have a, a, a you, know, you should have a senior uh, professional title. Uh, I think only Indonesia and some uh, very small, very uh, few countries have such requirements for arbitrators. And uh, this amendment uh, seems to make the requirements more strict uh, than relaxed. Uh, and also, Chinese law is silent on the distinction between independence and impartiality. So uh, we may suggest that when, when the further amendments uh, are, be, are to be made, that we can add the distinction between independence and impartiality uh, following international practice. And the proposed amendment uh, uh, suggests that the co uh, sorry, uh, that the parties can choose an arbitrator off panel, off the panel. So this might be a very uh, fundamental change because in China, if you want to uh, act an arbitrator, you must become first as a panel arbitrator in a specific arbitral commission, the commission. And, and nowadays, uh, if the new arbitration law comes into effect, then the parties can choose arbitrators off the panel. But of course, the uh, pre adding arbitrators might be still uh, be selected from the panel. Uh, but still, I think that the, the, the off, off the panel system greatly uh, uh, enhances the Chinese arbitration uh, in, this, in this regard. And also the validity of arbitration agreement. So there is a uh, notoriously a restrictive requirement on the current arbitration law that you must designate an arbitral institution, arbitration commission. And there are very huge number of cases addressing this issue, whether that selection is effective or not. But the devised drift, the proposed amendment that the only requirement is intention to arbitrate. And that is, a, I should say, it's a great progress. And uh, uh, with some, uh, with some uh, uh, supplementary provisions uh, in the, in later chapters to make this provision uh, workable. But the writing requirements uh, has not been changed. That under Chinese law, the uh, arbitration agreement must be in writing, and it must be signed by the parties. And with some exceptions, for example, that if you submit an arbitration uh, to CTEC, for example, and the respondent uh, is not challenged the arbitration and participated in the proceedings, that uh, it will be held that the arbitration agreement will be effective, even the parties have never signed the arbitration agreement. But oral contracts with the, with the parties specifically referring to an arbitration agreement separate, separately in existence, in existence, in written form, is uh, void and unenforced. So you cannot uh, enter into an oral agreement and it's saying that 
we just adopt an, an arbitration agreement in a standard standard contract uh, uh, in a business organization. And that type of arbitration agreement is not enforceable. So uh, let's move on to the separability of arbitration agreement. Uh, this is a very uh, interesting uh, point that under Chinese law, that uh, an arbitration agreement, uh, the, the validity of arbitration agreement prevails. The invalidity of the main contract, which includes the arbitration agreement. And in this amendment, two modifications have been made. The first is that when contract concluded, but not having taken effect, uh, this is a very unique Chinese law issue. And uh, I believe that many of the audience uh, have encountered this, uh, this, this issue when dealing with the Chinese Chinese contract. Uh, and also contracts having been descended. So uh, you can see that under the proposal amendment that the arbitration agreement survives. Even the matrix contracts having been modified, having been avoided. So avoided as a very unique Chinese uh, legal term. Uh, it's different from termination under English law. And it's also different from repudiation under English law. And there are a lot of disputes that the contracts, uh, whether the contracts have, have been relatively avoided. Uh, and also, uh, the, the main contracts having not taken effect, having been held invalid or having been rescinded, and, all, and also having been terminated. So there might be confusion whether they're uh, between termination and avoidance, uh, but this is not the subject of this discussion. But interestingly that there's no mention of existence. And the, Proposal for the proposal can be made that this proposal amendment can add one more point that the arbitral agreement survives even one of the parties uh, argues that the the contract and the arbitration agreement have never been in existence in existence and. Uh, uh, Competence to competence. There is a very significant change in, in this issue. That the first is that following the ancestral moral law regime, that when the court hears one of the parties challenge for the jurisdiction of the arbitral tribunal or the validity of the arbitration agreement. The court's judicial review of the jurisdictional challenge would not interrupt the arbitration uh, arbitration procedures. Uh, moving forward, uh, this is a great, uh, I should say, this is great uh, progress uh, in this proposed amendment. Originally, uh, even today, uh, if one of the parties goes to court having jurisdiction to hear uh, the juris uh, jurisdictional challenge or validity of arbitration agreement, uh, the, the arbitral tribunal or the arbitration commission should, should automatically stay the proceedings. The next issue is who are the parties in arbitration? And in this proposed amendment, uh, two grounds are added, making further parties bound by an arbitration agreement uh, to which he or she is not a part. The first one is the principal contract and ancillary contract. Now, this is a, 
a unique uh, civil law or Chinese law notion that uh, the main contract and the guarantee contract, or the main contract uh, and a security contract. It's called principal contract and ancillary contract. So the guarantor uh, may be bound by the arbitration agreement uh, between the creditor and debtor. But even the guarantor has not signed the arbitration agreement. Uh, this will greatly facilitate the third parties in arbitration system in China. And also more importantly, the derivative arbitration uh, that partners in a partnership uh, and or shareholders in a company, they can invoke arbitration agreement, arbitration agreement signed between the company or the partnership with a third party to enforce its own right. Uh, this will significantly relax the relatively strict a system of Chinese arbitration in terms of further parties. But today, only agency and assignment are available, available grounds to enforce arbitration agreement against a third party. And the following grounds, such as estoppel, alter ego, piercing the corporate veil, and succession for the party beneficiaries of group of companies uh, doctrine uh, not available uh, in China today. And also uh, no mention has been made in the proposed amendment. Uh, and it, also the arbitration law also made it clear about the state of arbitration. Uh, this, uh, and in competence and competence and the jurisdictional challenge, uh, issue that if a party has a challenge of the existence of the arbitration agreement or the validity of the arbitration agreement or any other jurisdictional challenge, the proposed amendment changed the time limit to the submission of defense. I think this is very similar to international practice. The first substantive submission or substantive response rather than uh, the, the, before the first oral hearing. And more importantly, that this decision is to be made by the tribunal rather than by the arbitration commission. And the most interesting point is that once such a decision by the arbitral tribunal has been made, the party is allowed to go to court within 10 days. But under answer model law is within 30 days. So now the proposed, proposed amendment is following the mode of answer model law. And uh, also the second level review is allowed, which means that the decision by the Chinese court is appealable. Uh, this is a significantly different from the current position that once a, once a tribunal has made decision, a tribunal or arbitral commission has made a jurisdiction decision, you cannot go to Chinese court for their judicial review. But I think uh, the legislators have not considered whether China should adopt the Singaporean model or German model allowing judicial review for a neg uh, uh, negative jurisdictional challenge, uh, a decision, which means that if a tribunal declares it has no jurisdiction, but parties, are, parties still can go to court to override the decision, making uh, uh, the arbitral tribunal um, uh, uh, exercise jurisdiction of the over the dispute. And uh, uh, the proposed amendment has made it very clear the equal treatment and uh, uh, providing uh, equal opportunity or reasonable opportunity to make, make a case and following the answer model re uh, regime, uh, treated with equality and given a full opportunity of presenting his case. 
but uh, it's not clear that it's full or reasonable. And uh, and also, the proposed manager said that undue delay and expenses should be avoided. It's very similar to uh, some moral law or English arbitration act. But confidentiality uh, of arbitration, uh, Chinese arbitration law is uh, is only concerns that a privacy issue. In other words, the, the oral hearing will be held in private. But no mention has been made about the confidentiality obligations on the documents in the arbitration. Sorry, Patrick, I'm, I'm sorry we are out of time already. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, I'm so sorry that uh, uh, probably I can, I can finish within one minute. Uh, okay. Yeah, and before my handing over to my, uh, my uh, partner. Charles. I'm uh, sorry, we, we won't have any time for that because we have uh, Hill Dickinson's presentation afterwards. Um, oh, yeah. Right, okay, we'll give, yeah. We'll give, yeah I, I guess, I guess, I'm sorry. So we, we have a lot of uh, issues we have no time to address. So I, I, I'd be very happy to share my slides. But because uh, Charles' presentation is rather short, so I still re uh, recommend uh, that Charles uh, make a very quick uh, presentation. Thank right. You. Okay. Um, what we can do is we'll we'll move on to Hill Dickinson's presentation, and then afterwards, uh, we we won't close the webinar. We'll hand it over to Charles if he's still there uh, at around eleven uh, ten or so. Is that okay? okay? Yeah, All right. Thank fine. you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Patrick, and thank you very okay. much for the presentation. And um, if anyone has any further questions or would like a copy of their slides. Uh, we'll share their email IDs uh, uh, in the chat function now, and then you should be able to uh, directly ask Patrick and Charles any questions or a copy of this slide. So thank you very much, Patrick. And Charles, we'll see you after Hill Dickinson's presentation. Um, now, if you can stop sharing your screen, Patrick, and, uh, uh, and also uh, your webcam, then we'll introduce uh, the Hill Dickinson team. Okay, now uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Yvette Yu and Nicole Wong from Hill Dickinson. Right, so I'll do very quick introductions actually. We have Yvette, Yvette Yu. Yvette is a litigator with extensive experience in advising and representing international clients on a broad range of disputes, including multi-jurisdictional corporate and commercial litigation, regulatory investigations, and enforcement actions. And we also have Nicole Wong, who specializes in broad spectrum of high stakes, cross-border corporate and commercial disputes and works closely with multinational corporations and high net worth individuals. Um, so now the presentation is over to you, Yvette and Nicole. You can share your screens. Right. So following Lin's presentation on the new proposed amendments in China arbitration law, uh, it's a nice segue to see what Hong Kong has been doing on the arbitration front and the judicial developments between mainland China and Hong Kong. In today's topic, my colleague Nicole and I will look into cross-border recognition and enforcement of court and arbitral proceedings in Hong Kong. Enforcement is usually the last step in the disputes process, but arguably it's actually the most important step. Without a successful enforcement, it's the difference between having a piece of paper saying that you win and actually getting your hands on the money or goods that you've been trying to recover after months or even years in court or tribunal, and all the time, labor, and legal costs spent along the way. But that's why we disputes lawyers are always plan from client's end game before we even start a legal action. How do you actually get the fish into the net? All the brilliant submissions and cute legal points don't actually matter if we can't give you the fish that you're after. So right, we have a lot to go through today and um, without further ado, I'll pass the time to Nicole to talk about recognition and enforcement of foreign judgments and awards. Well, thank you, Yvette, for that introduction. Um, the law relating to the application of foreign judgments in Hong Kong uh, fall within a rather complicated area known as conflict of laws. 
And uh, we can talk about this all day, but we don't want you to doze off behind your screens. So we will try to keep it light and interesting uh, by covering how the topic could be useful to you. So let's say your company successfully obtained a judgment against a counterparty in a foreign country, but the judgment debtor only has assets in Hong Kong. Now, naturally, you want to bring the judgment to Hong Kong so that it can be enforced against the debtor. However, foreign judgments have no direct force in Hong Kong unless and until they are formally recognized. And once recognized, uh, it can be enforced um, with the same force as a local Hong Kong judgment. So you can make applications for charging orders, garnishing proceedings, prohibition orders, etc. Now you can have recognition without enforcement, but you cannot have enforcement without recognition. So how do you get um, a foreign judgment recognized in Hong Kong? There are two ways. The first way would be enforcement by statute. So under the Foreign Judgments Reciprocal Enforcement Ordinance, there's a statutory registration scheme for certain types of foreign judgments. I've set out a list of the general requirements here, and I will go through a few of them. Now, in relation to the final and conclusive requirement, it would make no sense to enforce a judgment that was only interim in nature because the decision could be revisited by the foreign court. So the judgment has to be final and unalterable in the court which pronounced it. However, to avoid benefiting bad faith debtors who will try to delay proceedings, uh, judgments can be subject to contingencies and still be considered as final. So these include default judgments. So the debtor failed to defend the foreign proceedings and the judgment was entered. And also judgments under appeal could be considered as final as well. However, in practice, Hong Kong courts will usually stay execution until the final determination of that appeal. So next we have uh, superior courts. These uh, mean courts with unlimited jurisdiction in civil and criminal matters. And for Australia, there are specified courts um, that are considered superior, so including the Supreme Court, High Court, and Family Court, etc. Now, a definite sum of money is rather self-explanatory. Um, these include judgments for interest, legal costs, but they do not include judgments for tax, uh, fines, or penalties. And in the last bullet point, you see that this ordinance covers judgments from 15 designated countries, including Germany, Australia, India, Singapore, etc. Now, you may notice that these countries all share a distinct feature. They all have a special relationship with the United Kingdom, whether as part of the Commonwealth, such as Australia and India, or by way of treaty, such as the Netherlands. And they recognize each other's judgments on the basis of reciprocity. Now, Hong Kong's position after the handover is rather unclear because if Hong Kong is no longer a part of the Commonwealth, then would those countries still recognize Hong Kong judgments? This is a very live issue under Hong Kong law and because recipro re reciprocity is key. Now, in light of this section, 2A, 2B of the Interpretation and General Clauses Ordinance, only a reciprocal arrangements will continue to have effect after the handover. So it is likely in practice that a party seeking to enforce a foreign judgment under this ordinance and this statutory scheme, they may need to adduce appropriate foreign law evidence to prove that the foreign jurisdiction in question gives reciprocal treatment to Hong Kong judgments. Now, where the position is unclear, a debtor may well argue that the ordinance no longer applies because there is no longer any reciprocity between Hong Kong and that particular foreign territory. Now, the second method is the common law route. In practical terms, the statutory regime only covers 15 countries. So that this common law route is actually more widely used because it caters to every other country and it's not limited to only common law jurisdictions. So this will mean that judgments from many of Hong Kong's major trading partners, such as the United States or Japan, can be recognized in Hong Kong. Now, uh, these two methods, the common law route and the statutory scheme, uh, they're mutually exclusive. So if a foreign judgment comes within the ordinance, then any attempt to sue at common law will be struck out. Now, the requirements for eligible foreign judgments under the statutory method and the common law route are broadly similar. So, for example, the judgment must be final and conclusive and for a definite sum of money. However, there are important procedural differences. So, for example, in the common law route, a civil action must be brought on the debt created by the foreign judgment. 
And uh, the foreign judgment doesn't have to come from a superior court, and there's no requirement of reciprocity. Now, once the action is commenced, it is possible to apply for summary judgment against the debtor in Hong Kong. But the debtor could also raise defenses, such as that the foreign judgment was tainted by fraud or is contrary to natural justice, um, such as where he may, uh, the debtor may argue that uh, he or they had a lack of opportunity to participate in those foreign proceedings. But in any event, the Hong Kong courts will not conduct a re-examination of the merits of the decision in the foreign court. So instead of litigation in court, sometimes parties undergo arbitration instead and end up with an arbitral award. Hong Kong is a top commercial dispute resolution hub by reason of its pro-arbitration and pro-enforcement stance under the arbitration ordinance. Generally, there are three types of awards that can be recognized. Um, there are New York Convention Awards. These are awards made in 168 countries that are parties to the New York Convention on the recognition and enforcement of foreign arbitral awards. Uh, the second type is uh, PRC awards, and the third type, uh, there are all the other awards, and non-New York Convention awards and non-PRC awards. So in this segment, I will focus on the methods of applying uh, convention awards and non-convention awards, and I will refer to these as foreign awards. There are also two ways to give force to foreign awards in Hong Kong. So the first one is summary enforcement under statute. Under the arbitration ordinance, foreign awards can be entered as judgments in Hong Kong and enforced in the exact terms of the award with the leave of the court. This will mean that an application needs to be made to a judge on an ex parte basis with the uh, supporting affirmation evidence. Now, there is a duty of full and frank disclosure imposed on all ex parte applications, so all material facts will have to be disclosed. Now, the court would treat the application as almost a matter of administrative procedure and try to be as mechanistic as possible. And the, uh, the court will only refuse enforcement uh, on so, uh, some grounds, most of which are listed here on my PowerPoint. Uh, I will not go through each of these grounds, but you will see that uh, most of these grounds concern the possible in impeachment of the award itself. But it is important to bear in mind that the court will not go behind the reasoning of the arbitral tribunal or assess the merits of uh, the original case when, uh, when they consider the, uh, whether these grounds are applicable. So if a party genuinely believes that there is something impossible or invalid about the award, they, they should take it up with the court at the seat of the arbitration rather than with the Hong Kong court in this type of application. So after leave is granted by the court and the order is served on the debtor, there is a window of 14 days where the order and enforcement is stayed. Um, and during this window, the debtor can apply to set aside the court's order. And if the debtor does so, enforcement will be stayed until the application is finally disposed of. Now this statutory process is, uh, appears to be straightforward. It takes less time and usually costs less than our second option, but as we will see, this uh, statutory option is also rather more limited in application. So the second method would be enforcement of the award by commencing a fresh action in Hong Kong. This is by issuing a writ action against the award debtor for the breach of an arbitral award. And this method would typically afford more flexibility to the award creditor because there are a wider range of remedies available and uh, the court enforcing it will not be restricted to enforcing the um, uh, enforcing in the precise terms of the award. So some there are possible reliefs that are different to the statutory method. So these include uh, asking for a judgment for the amount of the award, a declaration that the award is binding, specific performance of the award, and damages for the failure to perform the award. Now you or your company will have to elect between these two methods and decide which to go for because if judgment is entered under the statutory process, then it is not possible uh, to coexist with a judgment uh, for common law action, uh, under common law action for damages. <clears throat> so just as a special point of interest, given the, ex given the exponential growth and development of technology, it is increasingly simple, easy, and convenient for debtors to move assets from country to country. As such, it is not enough to only focus on how to recognize and enforce foreign judgments or awards in Hong Kong, which could become hollow 
if a debtor is able to move assets out of the territory in order to defeat judicial processes. So um, our legal system now caters to the issue uh, by allowing courts to find interim relief in relation to proceedings which have been or are to be commenced in a place outside of Hong Kong and which are capable of giving rise to a judgment or arbitral award uh, that may be enforced in Hong Kong. Uh, thank you, Nicole. Now uh, we'll move on to talk about some special arrangements that have been in place between Hong Kong and mainland China. Uh, under the Article 95 of the Basic Law, which is the mini constitution in Hong Kong, uh, Hong Kong may, through consultation and in accordance with the law, maintain juridical relations with judicial organs with the other parts of the country, which is China, and they may render assistance to each other. So under Article 95 that I mentioned, uh, Hong Kong has so far concluded nine arrangements concerning mutual legal assistance with mainland China. We set out here the nine arrangements for your reference, but uh, we won't go through all nine of them today. We will focus on those uh, concerning civil and commercial proceedings and pick a few which has undergone recent changes and what those changes mean to parties in litigation and arbitration. So we can see here, number one to five, there is a variety of stuff uh, ranging from service, uh, taking of evidence, and also matrimonial and family cases. I'll ask you to make a mental note of number three uh, on uh, reciprocal recognition and enforcement of judgments uh, pursuant to court, choice of court agreements, uh, as we will come back to this later. So you can see on this slide, um, uh, some of them are not yet enforced in brackets. Uh, these mean, this means that they have been signed. We have the whole text already, but it hasn't been announced by the relevant authorities that they have taken effect. So number six, uh, reciprocal recognition and enforcement of judgments. Um, this has been signed, but not yet enforced, uh, but it has already made its presence, or should I say absence, felt. And number seven to nine concern arbitration and insolvency proceedings. As you can see from these dates, I think these are all very new developments that came into play in the last two years. Now we look at number six, uh, arrangements on the support, recognition and enforcement of judgments in civil and commercial matters. This was signed in 2019, uh, but that has not come into force yet. It will replace the 2008 arrangement, uh, the number three on the list that I mentioned earlier when it comes to force. Uh, we will see why this arrangement is so important in one of the cases in the next section. Uh, essentially, it significantly expands the scope of judgments that could be enforced between Hong Kong and mainland China by removing some of the restrictions and also expanding the scope to lower court judgments as well. For Hong Kong, for example, this covers judgments in district court, labor tribunal, and all the way down to the small claims tribunal. Number nine, this is the most recent one that entered into force in May 2021. And hot off the press, we have a decision in the Hong Kong court putting it into action. And we will look at that decision at the next section. What this does is uh, it provides a mechanism for insolvency office holders, including both liquidators and professional, uh, professional liquidators, to seek recognition of their appointments and powers and assistance to discharge their duties, for example, seizing assets in the other jurisdiction. This uh, arrangement is very new, so it is still now in pilot mode. At the moment, uh, three cities have been designated to test this arrangement in mainland. These are Shanghai, Xiamen, and Shenzhen. This is a much welcome development as, it's, as it brings efficiency and alignment of the insolvency processes in the two jurisdictions. And it also encourages coordinated debt restructuring efforts in both places and abroad. Number seven and eight are uh, concern arbitration, so we will look at it as a pair. The supplemental arrangement uh, actually supplements number two on the list earlier. So we already have mutual um, enforcement of arbitral awards since 2000, and this supplemental arrangement seeks to improve the 2000 arrangement. It brings the mainland Hong Kong arrangement more in line with the New York Convention. Uh, some of the major changes include the possibility of applying to courts for interim measures 
before and after making of the arbitral awards. So number seven on this list allows um, apply for court-ordered interim measures. And number eight uh, now confirms that these interim measures are available not only before and during the arbitral proceedings, but also at the enforcement stage. The supplemental arrangement also permits concurrent enforcement applications in both Hong Kong and mainland China. Hong Kong is currently the only seat of arbitration outside mainland China where parties in arbitration may apply to mainland courts for interim measures, for example, asset preservation orders pending the outcome of the arbitration. This makes Hong Kong a very attractive seat of arbitration, especially where the businesses and transactions involved have significant assets or interests in China. Now we'll take a look at the case law update uh, at how all the arrangements have been put into place and how they are applied in court. The first case is ICBC and Wisdom Top. So ICBC is the lender suing Wisdom Top as a defaulted borrower. ICBC managed to obtain a default judgment against Wisdom Top. In the facility letter, uh, it contains a typical asymmetrical jurisdiction clause found in international financial documentation. It says the courts of Hong Kong have exclusive jurisdiction, but it also contains a clause which says that for the benefit of the lender only, the lender may take concurrent proceedings in any number of jurisdictions. In this case, it was held that the asymmetrical jurisdiction clause does not fall within the meaning of choice of Hong Kong court agreement in the 2000 arrange, 2008 arrangement, which is number three that I mentioned earlier. Uh, in the judgment, it is referred to as the 2006 arrangement, uh, just because it was signed in 2006, but it actually came into force in 2008. Where ICBC is a plaintiff, the court held that um, the jurisdiction is at large, there's no certainty as to jurisdiction. But the court did mention that if, in this case, the borrower was the plaintiff, then there would be no issue, as uh, the borrower, as we saw earlier, is subject to exclusive jurisdiction clause. So the outcome for ICBC is that there's no reciprocal enforcement and they will have to um, go to mainland to issue separate proceedings against the borrower. This decision confirms that uh, asymmetrical jurisdiction clauses, um, which are very common in international financial documents, um, may not be the most appropriate for banks, uh, for example, banks and lenders, where the borrower has most of the assets situated in mainland China. We know that actually some banks have been reconsidering their standard form loan agreements because of this decision. But there is a silver lining. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, there's an arrangement signed in 2019, number six on the list. It is not yet in force, but if, well, even when it does, it will replace this current arrangement as discussed earlier. Uh, it would significantly widen the scope of this application, including removing the exclusive jurisdiction clause requirement. The second case is Samsung Paper Company. Um, the company was placed into creditors' voluntary liquidation of grounds of insolvency. It has substantial assets in mainland China and primarily in Shenzhen. So the liquidators applied to the Hong Kong court for a letter of request to be issued to the Shenzhen court, seeking recognition of the powers and appointment so that they can collect and deal with the assets in Shenzhen. Uh, it was held that um, the application was granted, so a letter of request was issued to the Shenzhen court. Uh, the court held that the company's center of main interest was in Hong Kong. Uh, the liquidators had a duty to collect the company's assets, and the assistance sought and relates to conventional asset collection. Uh, it, it is an encouraging case precedent. Uh, and from the decision, we can see that it is a relatively straightforward application. And we now will see how the Shenzhen court will respond. And hopefully, if this um, mechanism is successful, the pilot scheme will expand to other cities in China as well. Now we'll pass back to Nicole to talk about some practical tips um, that you can consider to maximize your recovery chances. Thank you, Yvette. Um, so hopefully, the tips that I'm about to share will be useful to you um, and your company when considering the terms of a transaction and they may uh, be, you know, they, it's possible that they can help you avoid or minimize disputes. So firstly, the uh, dispute resolution clause in a contract 
is often overlooked as a standard boilerplate provisions, but these could significantly affect your position in the event of a dispute. Now, though foreign judgments and local uh, slash foreign arbitral awards could be recognized and enforced in Hong Kong, it is important to bear in mind that litigation and arbitration, as well as other forms of dispute resolution, are distinct processes. So, for example, arbitration proceedings uh, are confidential in nature, whereas in the interest of open justice, court proceedings are generally heard in open court and judgments are available as a matter of public record. So whether your company is inclined uh, in minimizing publicity of its disputes or whether the counterparty has such inclinations could have a big impact on any pre-action settlement discussions that you may have. So how you draft the dispute resolution clauses could be a game changer. Now, it is possible to include multi-tiered uh, escalation clauses and to build in alternative dispute resolution processes to allow parties to try and settle amicably and to resolve their conflicts before resorting to legal action. There are also um, other types of clauses you may consider, such as liquidated damages clause or shortened limitation periods for specific types of claims. Now, the second matter to bear in mind is where to resolve the dispute and which system of law to use. The Hong Kong courts generally respect the party's choice of jurisdiction in which their disputes will be heard. It is therefore advisable to plan ahead and choose carefully as you would likely be bound by your choice at the time the contract was entered into and whereas the dispute might take place months or years down the road. So without a properly drafted jurisdiction clause, it opens the door to potentially costly and time-consuming preliminary battles uh, in court to first determine where the substantive dispute should be heard, and you will risk having parallel proceedings in multiple jurisdictions. So your choice of jurisdiction should best position you in terms of access to the most convenient and effective adjudication system, availability of interim and final remedies, and ease of enforcement against the counterparty. The location may also provide a strategic or psychological advantage as a party might have less appetite to fight legal proceedings in a foreign country, uh, which would normally incur a, a bigger investment on time and resources. Now, there's no one size that fits all. So to avoid uncertainty and potential satellite disputes within a substantive dispute, the governing law, um, the jurisdiction, and the method of dispute resolution well, uh, should be adopted and uh, considered in advance such that it will always cater to your specific business needs and so that you know, uh, your wishes will be reflected uh, when the dispute happens, when and if the dispute happens. So instead of just enforcing uh, judgments or foreign judgments or awards, it may also be possible to go straight to the insolvency process. This, this could be an alternative solution. So generally in Hong Kong, if a debtor owes $10,000 or more to the creditor, a creditor can serve a statutory demand on the debtor. And if he fails to repay the money requested within 21 days, then the creditor can issue a petition to wind up or bankrupt the debtor. Now, for example, in a 2016 case, Real Lucky Resources Hong Kong Limited, a petition applied to wind up a Hong Kong company on the strength of an arbitral, uh, arbitrary, arbitral award without first having it recognized in Hong Kong. Now, it was emphasized that the presentation of that winding petition did not constitute an attempt to enforce the award, and so the company was accordingly wound up. Now, the process of winding up can be straightforward or it can be quite long and contentious as well. So in our experience, winding up proceedings uh, is usually useful against debtors with a reputation to protect, uh, as the petition would have to be advertised publicly. Now, once the company or the debtor is wound up, the creditor will join, uh, and all unsecured creditors will join a pool of other unsecured creditors, and they will be ranked peri passu while they wait for the liquidators to try and recover the assets of the debtor and to distribute those accordingly. Uh, Raul, how are we on time? Do we have time to answer any questions? Out yes, there? we have. We have 10 minutes. Not a problem. Please answer any questions. We've, we've just got a question uh, asking, was the amount just mentioned 10,000 
Was it in US dollars or Hong Kong dollars? Yes, uh, thank you for that question. The amount of $10,000 is in Hong Kong dollars. So uh, you could say that the bar to uh, commencing these winding up proceedings is actually quite low and it would be perhaps sometimes more straightforward than uh, trying to enforce a foreign judgment or arbitrary. Uh, we don't see any further, oh, yes, we don't see any further questions. Um, but um, if you have any more questions, you can always contact Nicole and I. Our contact details are here. Uh, thank sure. you very much for having yes, us. Yeah. Actually, thank you very much, uh, Yvette and Nicole. We've got some questions here, uh, if you don't mind me asking. One of the questions is, the Foreign Judgments Ordinance recognizes judgments from 15 designated countries that have a special relationship with the UK. But how about judgments from the UK itself? Are those recognizable? Uh, thank you. Yeah, that's a good question, actually. Um, so... Uh, foreign judgments from the United Kingdom are not recognized under the Foreign Judgments Reciprocal Enforcement Ordinance. That is actually a different ordinance that used to cater to uh, UK judgments. That's the Judgments uh, Facilities for Enforcement Ordinance. Um, however, after the handover, it seems that the position in the United Kingdom is that they do not recognize Hong Kong judgments anymore because Hong Kong is no longer a part of the Commonwealth. And so it automatically fell outside the scope of the um, corresponding uh, administrative uh, Administration of Justice Act, I believe, in the UK. So hence, it would not be enforceable under the Foreign Judgments uh, Ordinance. However, um, there is the second method with the common law route. So an application could be made under that, uh, that method instead. And also, as we mentioned just now, it, it you know it's always it could also be an alternative to commence winding up proceedings directly on the basis of that foreign uh, UK judgment as well. So there are uh, alternative solutions. Great, thank you very much. Uh, we still have some more time, so if there are any questions for uh, Yvette or Nicole, please send us uh, these these questions in the Q and A box. Um, another question we have is. If the debtor has assets in Hong Kong, why not just start proceedings here to claim the debt rather than claim elsewhere than have the foreign judgment or award recognized in Hong Kong? Uh, well, generally, we will have to look at which court has jurisdiction over the dispute. Uh, sometimes the con contract may provide for exclusive jurisdiction clause or even non-exclusive jurisdiction clause. Um, for whatever reason, contractual parties may choose um, another jurisdiction uh, that may best suit their needs uh, to determine their case. Uh, that is one. Uh, number two is there may be an arbitration agreement as well uh, within the contract. In that case, um, the parties will have to follow uh, wherever the seat of arbitration chosen between the parties. And that is why, uh, even though um, it, it makes sense to go after where the assets are, but sometimes uh, you have to. Uh, honor the agreement uh, in contract itself. Okay, well, thank you very much for that answer. And lastly, what are the actual enforcement steps a judgment creditor could take in Hong Kong after the foreign judgment or award is recognized? Uh, yes, so um, winding up uh, a bankruptcy proceedings that Nicole mentioned earlier, uh, there's also uh, garnishing proceedings that we can issue. Uh, that is to freeze the money in, in a debtor's bank account and try to obtain it, um, pay it out to the judgment creditor. Uh, there's also a charging order on properties, uh, for example, real estate property or even shares in the company. And after a charging order has been made, uh, as order for sale can also be applied for as well. Um, there are also examination orders, so you can ask to inspect uh, and also question the company's uh, directors, for example, and officers as to where the uh, location of the assets are. Uh, these are some of the um, enforcement steps that we can take in Hong Kong to enforce uh, foreign or domestic awards and judgments. Thank you very much. Uh, and I think uh, we just have about one minute left. 
and uh, for your presentation. And then we'll we'll have we'll go back to Link's law firm's presentation. They have requested just five four minutes uh, to discuss very important amendments to uh, the laws that they were talking about. But before we go, um, there's one question from the audience. Uh, question is if we have transaction with china party having representative office in singapore which is better to choose singapore arbitration or mainland china arbitration would you like to answer that or should we uh, should, should the attendee email you separately for this yeah it really depends on um if um if the China party has uh, assets in China and that is what um, that may potentially be the most um, significant or valuable things that uh, that the, between the parties and the transactions, I you might want to go to Hong Kong or China for that uh, seal of arbitration. Um, of course, we always say that Hong Kong is the more preferred um, choice um, compared to Singapore because of the all the arrangements that we discussed earlier. Uh, at the moment, uh, as I said earlier, Hong Kong is the only seat uh, outside mainland China which has these uh, mutual assistance arrangements. So it's nice to see that. Yeah, thank you for all these questions. And it's nice to see that the audience is still with us <laughs> and they haven't those off behind the screen. So I think uh, the, if there's one thing to take away from our presentation today, it's that planning for a dispute doesn't start when you first realize you have a dispute. It starts from when you start entering into the transaction. There are actually a lot of factors to consider. So um, in a few words to sum up, always be prepared. Well, thank you very much for that very insightful presentation, Yvette and Nicole. Um, if anyone needs a copy of their slides, uh, please email them directly. Uh, their email IDs have been shared in the chat box and also they are on your screen. Um, thank you very much, Yvette and Nicole. Thank you for having us. Thank you, thank you very much. I'll stop sharing the screen now. Yes, please. Thank you. And you can uh, close your webcam as well. Right. Now, before we uh, end this uh, presentation, the, this webinar today, I'd like to go back to uh, Link's law firm and invite Charles Chin to do a five minute uh, presentation. Uh, Charles, would you mind uh, sharing your screen and your webcam, please? Good to see you, Charles. Uh, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Rahul. Uh, thank you, everyone who's still with us. Uh, following Patrick's most informative um, presentation just now, I uh, just want to make some further suggestions to the revised PRC arbitration law. First, I suggest it could be made clear that tortious disputes arising out of contract is arbitrable. Although I noted that recently the Supreme Court handed down a judgment in which the Justice of the Supreme Court is of the view that if it has been provided for in the arbitration clause that any disputes arising out of or in connection with the contract should be submitted to arbitration, then tortious disputes arising out of that contract um, must be submitted to arbitration. But unfortunately, this has not been made clear in the in my second suggestion is that IP, antitrust, bankruptcy disputes are arbitrable if the word is only binding into. My second, my third piece of suggestion is writing requirements of arbitration agreement should be further relaxed following unsuitable model law. My next Suggestion is that uh, hopefully in the future, witness statements and cross examination of, witness, of witnesses could be uh, more easily adopted in oral hearing of arbitration. 
My next suggestion is notice of arbitration and answer should be distinct from statement of claim and statement of defense the parties to allow the parties more time to prepare their pleadings. I also have a suggestion that uh, confidentiality and the privacy of arbitration should be more clearly provided. I noted that in some jurisdictions, the court has rendered a judgment that if the tribunal do not uh, hand down the a word, say, after 10 months or 12 months after the constitution of the tribunal, then the court will uh, intervene in the proceedings. But unfortunately, we cannot find similar provisions in the PRC arbitration law. Uh, according to my personal experience as a counsel and an arbitrator, I believe it is suggestible that if the tribunal unjustifiably delays the procedures, then the court can intervene and order its expeditious conduct of arbitration. Also, I believe it is advisable that it could be made, uh, it could be provided in the revised PRC arbitration law that the tribunal should be empowered to order security for cost. And also, I believe it is also advisable to suggest that the court should have power to review negative jurisdictional decision by the tribunal, not simply the um, positive jurisdictional decision. And also, I would suggest that more grounds such as estoppel, assumption, piercing the corporate veil, alter ego, group companies, uh, those type of things to be allowed in binding third party to arbitration. And I also want to suggest that conflict of law rules of arbitration be made more clear in the new PRC arbitration law. My last piece of suggestions is, hopefully the revised PRC arbitration law could have more clear rules about res judicata in arbitration. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Charles, and uh, you know, thank you for staying back and uh, finishing this uh, presentation. Thank you very much, and uh, that's uh, that's it from us. Actually, um, just before we go, I like to point out that uh, uh, we will be hosting our annual Hong Kong in-house uh, community congress, e-congress, in October. Uh, we're adding some more presentations along with. Uh, sanctions and export controls, employment, M&A, Cayman, Cayman and BVI laws. Uh, we'll do a panel discussion around diversity, quality and inclusion, as well as mental well-being. Um, if you'd like to register for these, uh, this particular Congress, uh, please wait for the survey to load at the end of this webinar. And uh, there will be an option you can click on it. In any case, when we start the registrations, you all will receive the registration link. Uh, so please do take the short survey after this webinar. And thank you again to our uh, to our co-host, Links Law Firm and Hill Dickinson. Uh, we'll see you in the next one. Thank you. Bye-bye.